Evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out. Thank you to Max. Thank you to Michelle for putting on this this awesome event. Like huge round of applause for them. Um, give it up. You know, designers and geeks is fucking amazing. Um, and I'm really, really lucky uh, to be up here. My daughter Skylar is in the front row, so if you see her running around, like she is with me, she is like under parental supervision. Um, <laughs> but say hi. Um, Thank you for, for coming out. Um, I'm unsure um, what I did to deserve this invitation, I guess, to, to speak at this event, let alone have people buy tickets, get off their couches after a long day at work, get up the 101, which is a shit show tonight. Um, it seems like a very long list of like equally improbable events that, that led us to be here tonight. Um, but I'm going to try and make it worth your while. Um, but frankly, I can't give you any points. Uh, no refunds, fortunately. Um, I want to start by taking you back in time, uh, quite a long way back in time to when I was in primary school. Uh, primary school is um, the same as elementary school in the US. Um, I was kind of a lonely kid, pretty much by choice, so don't feel too bad for me. Um, I generally kept to myself because sports were the thing that all of the cool kids were doing, um, and I hated sports, which is pretty ironic considering I spent 10 years of my career working at Nike, one of the biggest sports brands in the world. Um, but that's another story for uh, another day, I guess. Um, I wasn't particularly great academically. In fact, I was pretty awful. Um, the one saving grace was that I was pretty good at art uh, and drawing and generally pretty terrible um, about pro solving problems, uh, unfortunately. Um, which was fine, but when I graduated from school, I, I had to figure out what I was going to do to actually earn some money. So I decided to go with what I thought was going to be the easiest thing and the one that would uh, avoid me having to live in the real world too much, so I became a designer. Um, my first job um, as a professional designer was an actuarial consultancy, so for anyone uh, that doesn't know what that means, um, I was essentially in charge of designing the little booklets you get when you join a pension scheme. Uh, which is as dry as it sounds. Um, I had the, the unenviable job of making actualized death tables look, look good. I had a copy of Corel Draw and some clip art, and that was it. Um, the very first job that I actually got to send to a printer um, was a little leaflet um, that got sent to all our customers. It was about uh, public sector pensions. Uh, they came back from the printer. Um, We got 30,000 of them made. I was so stoked about it. Um, I stayed late um, and went around and put them on everybody's desk, um, feeling pretty proud of myself. Um, came in the next morning. Um, I'd already gotten some emails asking me to spell check the leaflet. Um, and I had misspelled a word and left out the letter L in the word public. Um, so that was. So that was job number one. Um, that was 1995. Um, so here we are in 2016. Um, and for some reason, unbeknown to me, I'm, I'm still a designer. Um, how many other designers do we have in here? Like, probably quite a few, right? Yeah, OK. Um, awesome. This talk might make you feel bad. Uh, but I'll try and make you feel good again. Um, I've been spending some time wondering about what the biggest problem we face in design right now is. Um, it seems as though we spend a lot of time and energy talking and arguing about what some of those problems are. Uh, should designers code? How should we best prototype the products that we work on? Uh, should we re release a minimum viable product and then iterate or the other way around? Should we be optimizing for mobile? What's the best way to manage creative teams? Um, I've been thinking about all of those questions, all very valid um, and up for debate, um, and a few more besides. Um, but I think I have figured out what the biggest challenge we face in design. The biggest challenge we face in design right now 
is the Greenland ice shelf is melting. The biggest problem we face in design right now is that one in five kids in the US is hungry. The biggest problem we face in design right now is 8,612 gun deaths in the US so far this year. That's of this morning, by the way. It's probably changed since then. The biggest problem we face in design right now is that we are in the middle of an election campaign in which we're deciding if we want to elect somebody president who, when asked if he would use nuclear weapons, says, well, if we're not going to use them, what do we have them for? Um, these feel like big, intractable problems. Um, but I do believe that as a cohesive and motivated unit, the world of design can actually do something about these. Um, and many others, big and small. The moment is right and the momentum is behind us. For years, we've been pleading for a seat at the table. For years, we've been saying, but you should value design. It will make your product and your company better, stronger, more relevant, infinitely more successful. But the time has come. We can't take that seat at the table for granted. We're no longer the artistic types who sit in the corner and draw stuff all day. We're no longer an afterthought or the final stage of the last layer. When the real work has been done and they need someone to, to make it look pretty. We're no longer the undervalued creative class. We have, in fact, done it. We've made it. And we should all pat ourselves on the back for that. We've convinced them of our, of our value. We have their ear and we have access to their checkbooks. It's been a hard-won victory. But now, um, after years of struggle, they actually value design. How something works actually is the design. The way we craft the interactions and flow and look and feel is the product. And how well we execute on those relates absolutely and directly to the success of a product, and the product is the business. It is the user experience. Companies rise and fall based on the quality of the work that their design teams put out into the world. Power to the people, and we have been granted great power people. Pop the champagne and start the clocks on the four-year vesting schedules. But, and there's always a but, I need to burst your balloon a little bit. I'm here to tell you, my fellow designers, that although we have been bestowed great power, we're drunk on that power and we're reneging on the responsibilities that have been given to us. We're failing ourselves and those that have hired us. Frankly, we're fucking it up. I believe that as designers, we have certain responsibilities. Responsibilities to the craft. Responsibilities to your fellow designers and collaborators. And a responsibility to work on products and projects that impact the world in a positive way. I personally believe that if you're not willing to accept these responsibilities, then you really have no business in being a designer. We have a great opportunity in front of us. We can choose to be selfish and design and create for ourselves, or we can take the harder path, the little worn path that looks for work that's the hard work, the good work, and the work that benefits all of us. When we work together on projects for the greater good, we can truly make a positive impact on the experience that we have on this earth and for those that come after us. As I see it, these are the responsibilities that we have as designers. If we grab these responsibilities with both hands, we can truly achieve greatness. And I believe that there are three key areas that we need to focus on and get much, much better at if we were to fill the, fulfill the obligations that come with the title design. So, number one, a responsibility to the work. What do I mean by the words, the work? I'm talking about the process. I'm talking about the phases that we move through as we bring pro projects to life. How do we carry ourselves? And what is the appropriate attitude to carry through each of those phases? First of all, if we are to be a core part of the process, like how we've, have been, how we've asked to be, then we need to actually act like we give a shit. As we like to say, design is problem solving, or some variation on that description. It's not art, nor is it magic. It's a process, and we do not embark upon that, the journey of design alone. We rely on many other people to help bring our collective visions to life. 
and to validate that they make sense. We need to be collaborative, working with our partners in product management, research, copywriting, marketing, engineering, the list goes on. They're a fundamental part of the job. And to do this well requires humility, a recognition that we do not have all the answers. We have some of them, but only when we work as a team with those in other disciplines can we be sure that the answers are right and correct. Humility and lack of ego are absolutely key. Far too often I've seen designers walk into a room believing that they're the star of the show. You're not a special snowflake and the business problem that you are being asked to solve is not your opportunity for self-expression. That's what side projects are for. Nor is the business problem an opportunity to better your personal brand. It's not your chance to chase dribble likes or Twitter faves. The person who is asking you to design for them needs something because that is something that they cannot do for themselves and they need you to have your shit together. If you agree upon a deadline, you need to meet it. Make sure you read Design as a Job by my friend Mike Montero. It will tell you everything you need to know about having your shit together uh, and being professional in a way much more eloquent than I can do tonight. Next, I need to reject the notion of hustle. Jamming on a side project late at night while you're watching Netflix on the couch is not hustle. Hustle is something different to what we've be begun telling ourselves that it is. And I want to tell you a little story to illustrate that. Ahmed left Syria and Europe in 2011 because the security forces killed most of his family. His long journey began when he left Syria to Egypt and then Lebanon. He thought he could stay in Cairo and work, but the situation in Egypt was unstable. He struggled for 40 days in Egypt until he decided to go to Europe. He tried three times to successfully make the journey. The last and successful time was on a two-level boat. The smugglers that they'd paid $1,000 to managed to cram more than 730 people aboard. After a few hours sailing in sea, the boat started to sink and water started to leak inside. They started to bail the water out using buckets for 24 hours non-stop. A few hours later, they noticed a helicopter on the horizon circled around them in the air for a few minutes and then left. Right after that, they saw a ship with a Danish flag approaching them. While they tried to get close to it, the big ship hit the nose of the boat and made it sink even faster. People started to jump off the boat. And for 30 minutes of chaos, there wasn't any kind of rescue happening. After Hamed jumped off the boat, he started to swim towards the ship. When he finally reached it, he looked back and saw this horrifying scene of people fighting for their lives. A rescue team had been deployed, it took at least five hours to rescue anybody. And then only with the aid of the Maltese Coast Guard. Nine people drowned in 30 hours, and 30 others who were in the lower level of the boat suffocated to death from smoke when the engine died. The rescue boat dropped them off in Catania, Sicily, where they were put in a camp and warned uh, that they would be fingerprinted the next day. Early in the morning, Ahmed and a few others managed to escape the camp and made their way to the train station. Ahmed was able to make it all the way to Milan, Italy. Ahmed and his friend headed to France after that, but they were caught by the French police. They took their fingerprints and sent them back to Italy. Back in Milan, they met a smuggler who took them by car, smuggled them into Germany. Once he entered Germany, he turned himself into the German police in Dortmund. After three months in Germany, Hamid was finally granted refugee status and became a legal resident of Germany. He's currently taking German language courses and is preparing to go back to college and continue his studies in French literature in the near future. That's fucking hustle. Hustle is the single mom working three jobs to make rent, keep their kids in school. Hustle is the first kid in the family gets to attend college, and works to 2 a.m. 2 every night to afford tuition. Hustle is working 40 hours a week and taking care of a sick relative at the same time. There are a million stories like these, told a million different ways. There may be some of you here tonight with stories like these, um, 
to those people, I salute you because you are truly heroes. We fetishize this idea of hustle, and we need to quit it. The idea that having to be in a constant state of stress as a way to create success is bullshit. Your side project is in all likelihood not hustle. It's much more likely to be an avenue for self-expression, a chance to do something that you don't get to do in your day. Something that you can share on social media to bolster your personal brand. Let's just call it what it is and not assign some bullshit label to it. There's no shame in it. Side, pro side projects can help us learn new skills and grow as people and as designers. But that disrespects the people who are actually being incredibly creative in order to make ends meet for themselves and their family. I read a quote recently that says, I think designers are in one of the few, if not the only roles, where it seems that everyone in the company feels like they have the right to comment on your work. There's such a culture of critique around design deliverables that doesn't exist with any other type of uh, deliverable. For designers, a typical day is everyone telling them what's wrong with their work. Well, here's the news. Get fucking used to it. When design is important, everyone has an opinion. That's a good thing. We need to be able to stand behind our decisions. The day that when I, once again nobody cares about design is a day to be very, very afraid of. So let's buckle up and do the job right. Number two, our responsibility to the people. People are at the center of everything we do and at the center of our experience on this planet. We all owe somebody in our life a debt of gratitude. Our parents for raising us, our significant others for putting up with our creative brains, our teachers and those that took a chance on us. They deserve to be honored. So please, let's not forget them or ever allow them to feel underappreciated. We also owe a responsibility to the other designers around us and the vibrant and diverse community that they are. Designers love to argue. Let's make sure we argue about the things that matter. Leave your ego at the door and discover the benefits of, of community. You've already made a great start by coming out here tonight. Seeking out other points of view is the path to inspiration. We need to remember that when building our teams and our networks. Otherwise, homogeneity beckons and homogeneity is the devil. No matter how good the product you make with your team of 10 or 12 white dudes, I guarantee you there is something that you are missing. Opportunity that goes begging due to the homogenous nature of your teams. It's a path well documented and well traveled. It's also really fucking dull. The systems that are in place are designed to benefit people that look like me. We need to reject those systems. Do not call yourself designers if you are designing for the few and not for the many. And if you are solving a problem that only exists for someone like you or the people that run in the same circles, then it is your responsibility to move past a myopic view of the world, learn something. You will only ever be a fraction of the designer you are capable of being if you surround yourself with homogeneity. When we talk about people within the context of design, we generally focus on the people that can help make design happen. Our fellow designers, our colleagues, the companies that we work with. But I just want to stop for a second and acknowledge that what we choose to do for a living affects our families more than anyone, and it is them that we should be, should be top of mind when we are knee deep in it. Very, very fortunate to have an incredible supportive wife, Sarah, and daughter, Skylar. I'm grateful to the talented friends we have that can be an inspiration to her. People are not just design, people and the most creative people I have met are not design. The third and final responsibility we have after the work and the people is to the future. We need to think long and hard about the types of things that we want to build. We need to ask ourselves some critical questions. Who is it benefiting? What is the impact to individuals or the community? Are we helping the few but hindering the many? I want to talk a little bit more about the product projects that we choose to work on. It's nice for us all to be able to order dinner on our phones and have that delivered to us without having to interact with another human. It's great that I can have someone come pick up my laundry, pick out clothes for me and send them to my front door and pick up the ones that I don't want to keep. 
safe to say that we've pretty much nailed the on-demand food market. But I wonder how many of the designers working on the products that serve to make the lives of the comfortable a little bit more comfortable stop to think about the wider implications of their work. How do we avoid situations where we're blinkered in our approach to solving problems? Talk about empathy. <laughs> empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of others. And designing with empathy. Empathy is pretty hot right now. But empathy is not really enough. We actually need to hire people who can bring a diversity of thought and show us angles that our experiences haven't shown. We approach our relationships and projects from this place that sits beyond empathy. We can stop thinking about the prospect of changing the world with another app to bring us dinner. If our political system had been designed from beyond empathy, we wouldn't be arguing about whether a woman has the right to decide what goes on in her own body. We wouldn't be having a discussion on whether certain people have more right to be married than others. If our social systems had been designed from beyond empathy, we wouldn't be dropping $4 on a piece of artisanal toast on the way to my nap pod in San Francisco while stepping over the homeless people in the methadone lines. If our gun laws had gone through half the number of iterations as the average social media app, I wouldn't be dropping off my seven-year-old off at school every day and wondering what would happen if someone decided to walk into a classroom with an AR-15 assault rifle, which, by the way, I wonder every single fucking day. There's an inherent selfishness to these things we call human beings. We have a great ability to say that we care about something, yet at the same time turn our backs. And I call upon every one of you to try and start to do something about it. Take our combined knowledge and creativity and ingenuity and innovation and use it to help people. We can do some pretty special things. Let's not turn our backs on the things that are hard to fix. We need big solutions to big problems. We hire the right people with diversity of background and diversity of thought. We can step out of the mindset of trying to design with empathy, actually find some people who know something about the problem we are trying to solve. Don't just try and imagine what it's like to walk in someone's shoes. Hire someone who owns those shoes and actually walks in them every day. That's the way that we can find solutions. The purpose here is not to beat up on every tech company out there. They make our lives easier after all. Some of them, a lot of them. I use most of them and just as much as anybody else, but nothing comes without cost. So how much are we willing to give up? Let's just be aware of the cost. How much are we willing for our Bay Area rents to rise before we actually start working on a solution from the inside? How much does that loss factor into the decisions that designers make when they are taking on a new product? It might be attractive to work on a new app that does your laundry for you, but creating a new world sounds pretty cool on a resume. But that new world doesn't work for the family-owned laundrette that's been on the same street corner for 30 years who know their customers by name, know their requirements and their schedules and their preferences, and are now out of business because of an on-demand laundry service. It doesn't work for Neil Hutchison, who's renting San Francisco for an apartment in North Beach, just went from $1,800 a month to $1,000 a month. No notice, no reason given. Tech is full of straight white dudes. That's a problem we can do something about. The US still doesn't have paid maternity leave, at least not properly. That's the problem that we can do something about. Women still earn less than men. That's a problem we can do something about. California's in a severe drought. That is a problem that we can do something about. 52,000 gun deaths a year is a problem that we can do something about and don't let anybody fucking tell you otherwise. But we can't do it on our own. Can't do it sitting in our kitchens, drinking coffee and scrolling through Twitter. There's a power in our, our combined voice. Our ideas get amplified when we share them, when we talk about them and when we riff on them. When we connect our ideas, we can build the systems that make a difference. But we can only do that when we don't shy away from the big problems and leave it for somebody else. It's our perception of these big problems that scare us 
their perception of these problems as large, immovable objects that put us off. We spend a lot of time and energy actively avoiding them because we don't think we can make a difference on our own. That's not the answer. Big problems can be broken down into small pieces, the same as anything else. And if we want to call ourselves problem solvers, as designers like to do, we'd better start figuring out some solutions. Figuring out how to present a prototype of our work isn't really a problem anymore. We've figured that out. Figured out a way to get from A to B without standing to hail a cab. So now that's done, we can draw a line under it and move on to something a little bit more worthwhile. The AIGA will not save us. Creative mornings will not save us. Twitter or Facebook will not save us. Posting on Dribble will not save us. We can only save ourselves, and that means taking personal responsibility for meeting some of these problems head on. Let's all raise our voices as one and get after the things that we can change when we work together and amplify those voices. Like figuring out a solution that allows the teachers from the San Francisco public school system to actually be able to afford an apartment in the city. Like bringing education to every single child. Like telling the NRA to go fuck themselves. There are people who are already doing these things. Read Helena Price's Techies project, which is a very visual storytelling project that brings to life the depth and breadth of underrepresented minorities in the tech industry is wonderful. Please see it if you haven't already. Mike Montero is leading the charge of getting rid of guns on Facebook's marketplace. Get involved with that if you believe in it and can spare a few minutes each day. Beth Dean, who is here today, is doing amazing things with ethical design at Facebook. A product that has over 1 billion users needs to be able to accommodate for each individual user's story and circumstances, and she is leading the charge for that. Be fucking applauded for it. Amber Disco and the digital team at Hillary for America are doing some incredible things. Robin Canner at Amazon is doing amazing things and in bringing information on healthcare to the trans community. That's just a small selection, and all of them are small projects that have become something bigger. I have faith on us. Science will tell you that at a cosmic level, we're all connected in some way. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, and we really are all made of star stuff, Carl Sagan famously said. Then there's an undeniable bond that exists between us that social media addiction cannot possibly break. Wrapped up somewhere in the overlap of physics, chemistry, biology, probably some other intangible stuff. More our children will judge us for the decisions that we make today. They will judge us harshly. So let's go out there and try and make some.